Good morning, everyone. And uh, happy May Day, and it's an absolutely glorious day out there. I'm Richard Gray, and welcome to this, the Friends of Richmond Park Beautiful Birds webinar, where we have the huge pleasure of welcoming the urban birder himself, David Lindo, and where we'll also look at some of the marvelous migrants and remarkable resident birds of Richmond Park. This is the last in our winter and spring Zoom series about Richmond Park's wildlife. Um, the COVID winter has been really hard on the parks. If, if you go to the park regularly, you'll know this. Although it's wonderful that so many people have experienced the park and its wildlife, and we know how important nature and green environments are for our physical and mental well-being. The highest visitor numbers ever experienced in the park, combined with the long, cold and very wet winter. Yes, it was very wet in February and March, if we can remember that back that long with this, now with this drought. And the big increase in uh, new dog owners, often with untrained dogs, means wildlife, particularly ground nesting and other birds, is under great pressure. And the same is true in many other parks and open spaces. And of course, there's many excellent dog owners out there, but don't forget, um, from May the 4th until the 2nd of August, this was just announced this week, um, all dogs on leads, it's absolutely compulsory. But today's a celebration of our beautiful birds. During the lockdowns, many of us have noticed bird song and bird habits, perhaps more than ever. I watch them out in the garden all the time, as well as in the park, and uh, they just seem to be more of them making more noise, which is fabulous. And as another David, that Attenborough chap you may know, said, everyone likes birds. What wild creature is more accessible to our eyes and ears as close to us and everyone in the world as universal as a bird? So quickly looking at today's schedule, schedule as well as two presentations from, from David Lindo about urban birding and migratory birds, in between we'll also premiere our new short film about some of Richmond Park's most celebrated birds. And then finally, it will be your chance to ask David some questions. And at that time, we'll be joined by Nigel Jackman, who's chair of the Richmond Park Bird Group. And you can send in your questions anytime during the presentation. Use the Q&A button, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. But before all of that, um, let's have a little bit of fun. And before I turn to David, let's get underway with this bit of fun. Um, during today's webinar, we're going to give you a few little tests. Do you know the songs of some of our favorite birds? In a moment, we're gonna play around 30 seconds or so of a bird singing, and you'll be given four choices on screen. Choose one and send your vote, and we'll see how we all get on. Don't worry. Don't worry if you get it wrong, no one else will know, you're just marking it for yourself. So here's bird number one. Cast your votes. I think we're getting to the end of that. So there's your 30 seconds. So let's, um, let's have a look at the results of that, shall we? Ah, so you can see we've got 13% um, so it was a nightingale. Now I heard a nightingale last week and I'm afraid it wasn't a nightingale, although I wish it was. Um, next up, black, black cap at 14%, a blackbird, 25%. Yeah, I could get that, but those who said a song thrush, you were absolutely right. It was indeed a song thrush. So that's our, um, that's our first little quiz, and I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and now I'd like to make an introduction to David Lindo. Um, that's the main reason why you've joined us today, namely the remarkable resident birds, and especially the miraculous migrants that journey thousands of mi miles to enrich our bird population each year. Here to talk about them and the fun and enjoyment of the birding experience, is David the, the urban birder. Now the RSPB has over 1.1 million members and its magazine, this wonderful thing, is one of the most widely read um, in the UK of any magazine. And David, there he is, is one of their most prominent columnists. 
Um, his latest piece reveals that he was a goalkeeper. He used to get distracted by birds landing on the pitch. Could be dangerous that as a goalie. So hopefully there were no own um, goals. He's also, he's also a book writer. He's written um, four books, uh, written and co-written four books. Perhaps this is one of his most, his most famous there. And this really is um, a special book, both for seasoned birders, uh, reminding them why they love to go out birding, but also especially for newcomers uh, to birding with incredibly useful help and advice, tips on binoculars and, and equipment and so on. As well as a well-known birder and naturalist, David organises tours, webinars, courses and more. And of course, he's also well known on TV and in other visual media. If you've not seen him in action, here he is. There's a short video about him. So let's play that now. A great place to involve yourself in birding is in your local park. Try to choose a park with a variety of different habitats, woodlands, grasslands, or a bit of scrub if you're lucky. Best of all, if there's a water body like a lake, that could be a real magnet for birds. Small birds need to drink, and water birds wouldn't be water birds without water. Over a period of time, you'll begin to know what kind of birds to expect. But I've got to say, one of my favorite places for watching birds in urban areas has got to be on top of a roof. With the right wind conditions, it might be possible to witness movements of birds like swallows, finches, and pipits. Later in the morning, when the sun rises and the, the, the air is heated up and the thermals are created, you might be lucky enough to find a raptor riding on the air currents. Getting into birding is easy and won't take up a load of time. It will leave you feeling grounded and ready for the day. So get out there and don't forget to look up. Alison and I, um, we've actually, I don't think we've actually physically met, have we? Uh, no, we have, we have. We met two years ago when I was in my Yeah. And I was very excited because both, basically Alison is um, an ambassador for the London Wildlife Trust as well. So that's basically why you were there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it was just lovely to be there that night and meet you and, and get your book and, you know, rummage through the book. I mean, it's just great. I mean, it was lovely. So thank you for your book. <laughs> <laughs> this is the culprit, the ring-necked parakeet, normally found somewhere up a Himalayan mountain. Why has it swapped Asia for Asia? Our birdman David Lindo has been figuring out how they got here and if they're heading your way. It's just gone seven and I'm waiting for what I know will be an amazing, noisy wildlife spectacle. And here it comes. Incredible. It is absolutely amazing. I shall have a lot now. And they still keep coming. Every evening, over 7,000 rose-winged parakeets roost in these trees. But we're not in the tropics. We're not in India. This is Surrey. Isha Rugby Club, to be precise. And these colourful and very sociable birds are absolutely thriving here. It's estimated that there's around 30,000 parakeets living wild in the UK. And experts believe that this will rise to 50,000 by the end of the decade. So, David, thank you for that, David. Um, wonderful. Those parakeets, I think actually most of them you find in Richmond Park these days. Uh, we, have a, we have a huge number there. But, David, over to you now. Um, but as a goal, goalie, I hear you were called the cat. Is it true? And were you any good? Well, I used to be called, by the way, thank you very much, Richard, and the friends of uh, Richmond Park for inviting me today. Um, very much an honour for me. Um, yes, I used to be called actually the bird loving cat. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I did once was playing football. I looked up and saw a peregrine and I stopped the game and I said, look, there's a peregrine. And someone said, you stopped the effing game for a pigeon. But uh, I was still happy to do it. <laughs> OK, David, well, over to you. We're all looking forward to your presentation. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, lovely to see you all. I'm going to see if I can now, yeah, that's it. That's what I like it. The screen's more how I, I like it. Okay, so here we go. I want to, I'd like to talk to you about urban birding very, very briefly, um, and also talk really just about some of my experiences within London. I have visited region, uh, Richmond Park a few times. Um, in fact, I even used to live within the borough many moons ago, but I am essentially a West London boy. This is Notting Hill. For those who may or may not recognise the Nando's I'm lying in front of. And it's interesting, it's interesting to note that people never look up. You can be standing on the first story of a building completely naked with your arms open and no one would ever see you because most people look straight ahead or at the windows. Apart from that guy in the stripy top, top he's a man after my own heart. The other people, I was lying there and people just walking past as if I wasn't even there. <laughs> it's just incredible. Um, anyway, a bit about me. Um, I was um, born, believe it or not. <laughs> no, I was born interested in natural history from day one, in fact, before, before day one, I'd say. Um, I had no one around me that had any interest at all. I was born in um, Park Royal and raised uh, in Wembley and spent my formative years in Paddington and Notting Hill and places like that. But um, I had no one to show me anything, so I kind of taught myself and I did the Malcolm Gladwell thing and my 10,000 10, hours was done by the time I was age seven, because by that point, I nipped into the local library and picked up birds of Britain and Europe uh, with North Africa and Middle East. I couldn't believe that there were so many birds to be seen uh, in that region. I didn't know any of the birds' names at the time. I was calling, at that point, calling sparrows, baby birds, starlings, mummy birds, and black, black birds, daddy birds. So I had no idea. And basically I had this book <clears throat> And I read it inside out, back to front, sideways. I couldn't believe, I got it here. I couldn't believe the different plumages. And by the time I read it all, I knew every single species, their scientific name, where they came from, their colors. By the age of eight, I was a, a, a veritable walking encyclopedia on birds. Uh, around that age, I also discovered Birds of Town and Suburb by Eric Sims. Now, Eric Sims uh, is, well, was a hero of mine. He died, unfortunately, back in the 90s, but he was, I think, 90 odd anyway, so he had a fair innings. But uh, basically, um, he was a prolific writer, broadcaster for the BBC. Um, he wrote a whole ton of books. I happened to cross this one. It turned out to be unofficially, as far as I knew, uh, my, my um, manual on urban birding because he talked about watching birds in areas that I never considered, you know, ranging from your garden to landfill sites to basically anywhere. So he's a guy, I suppose, that really instilled the idea, again, unconsciously in my mind about looking up because anything can be anywhere at any time. So if I can get on to uh, this urban birding as far as I'm concerned, I'm concerned is about this statement from Marcel uh, Proust I think it's uh, it, it, it basically encapsulates everything to do with watching birds in urban areas and wildlife for that matter in urban areas because you need to open your mind to the idea that a this wildlife is there but b you can see it if you see it the way wildlife sees it so in other words when you think of a way think of how a bird would see the environment it's not a street with a couple of trees and a couple of houses they're cliffs there's a fragmented wood there's rivers you know you've got to think of it in that respect and then that's when you start seeing birds so i'm going to quickly take you to two spots um in london that i've known very well um the first of which it's probably the place that I'm best known for and probably the place, in fact, not even probably, is the place that gave birth to the um, birder and that's Wormwood Scrubs. Um, I'm sure most of you at least have heard of the prison um, of the same name. Now, Wormwood Scrubs, as you can see, is a large green area, 
and there's not much else in the way of greenery until you head further south. In fact, maybe two miles down, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but maybe two miles down south past Castle now is in fact the London Wetland Centre. So probably, you know, the London Wetland Centre and Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens are the nearest real sort of substantial areas of green. And here you are right at the very bottom with Richmond. But Wormer Scrubs is a place that I've been visiting for well over 25 years now. Um, it's a, a park which is 183 acres. Um, it's predominantly sports fields, but there is a very slim uh, ring of woodland around the site, which, to be honest, you can walk through in about 15 seconds. I mean, there's not much to it at all. The best areas for birding are in the western areas. Um, this is a map which was produced maybe 10 years ago. Unfortunately, things have changed. Um, I'm sure you all know about the uh, the dramas and the the woe that uh, is being wrought upon all of us that are interested in conservation by HS2. And um, unfortunately, Worm and Scrubs has not escaped that, and I'll touch on that slightly later. But it's a beautiful place. I love walking around, especially when I was really active there for 20 years or well, 25 years actually until about five years ago when I started to travel around a lot more but it's a place that I used to walk around a lot and I just imagined myself being in Norfolk or in Suffolk or in on the Isles of Scillies or Fair Isles you know just somewhere completely different because it's, it was essentially the same place because if I was walking around in the autumn and I imagined myself in in the Fair Isles then I saw birds that I could potentially see in the Faroe Isles. I know it sounds crazy, but it's all about realizing that a piece of habitat, no matter how fragmented and small it is, can attract interesting birds. Now, one example, a bird that you get in Richmond Park, I don't, I'm not sure how often now, but certainly due to winters in the past, Dartford warbler, a, a warbler that essentially was a southern England bird basically and it's kind of moved sat, uh, north slightly it's now found in places as far north as uh, as East Anglia but um, I remember once walking around the scrubs with the then editor of bird watching magazine this was back 15 16 years ago when I first started as the urban birder and we walked past the only gorse bush on the whole site and I said to him you know you need to imagine that you're a bird and anything can turn up anywhere at any time and think of yourself being somewhere different. And at that moment, there was a rustle in the gorse bush and out popped a Darford warbler. The editor nearly had a heart attack. He said, oh my Lord, he said, I don't need to go to Arne in Dorset now. This is a lifer for me. I can't believe that I've seen a Darford warbler here in central London. So it's all about opening your mind to the thoughts and the ideas that birds are everywhere and as i say i just love this place to death it's my you know it, when people ask me where's the, your favorite place in the world and here i am for example in extra Madrid in spain i always cite worm scrubs because it's a place that really as far as i'm concerned put me on a map in my career but also it's a place that i discovered and learned to love over the years um, we have an area of grassland. I want to quickly run through a couple of things about the site. We've got an area of grassland, which unfortunately now has become quite um, degraded and it's, it's actually quite scrubby now. But in the past, it had quite a good balance of vegetation in terms of high and low vegetation. And it attracted meadow pipits, as you can see um, in the sign. I discovered um, one day that there were six uh, birds, six males displaying in the region. And it turned out that they were the closest, this was the closest breeding colony of meadow pipits in London, in terms of to central London. And we had more breeding pairs or potential breeding pairs than Bushy Park. So that, that was a real achievement. And I was so, you know, trying so hard to conserve these birds because it was tough. Um, trying to ward off dog, water, dog, dog walkers and, you know, we know the problems in terms of people walking without dogs and leads and we had the same problems at the scrubs. 
we tried, I mean, there was one instance when the Skylarks turned up. I remember when they turned up, I heard the Skylarks singing on the scrubs. I couldn't believe it. It was like, oh my God, that's just incredible. And when I discovered they were holding territory, I tried to guard their nests. But the thing is, I was guarding just for a couple of hours in the morning before going to work. So obviously when I left, all hell broke out. And I remember two weeks on coming back and you know trying to stop people walking through the areas with their dogs, even though we had signs up saying, you know, please keep out. And I saw the Skylarks fly off one by one heading east, never to return. And it was a, a very sad day for me. Um, unfortunately, um, there's not much better news about the Menopipids because they uh, became extinct as breeders two years ago, which um, has greatly saddened me. But I hope that um, future management of the, of the grassland area could be the answer and may attract them back. But one of the key birds for me at the Scrubs and another bird that you know perhaps should have been on the list uh, that I was given regarding a marvelous migrants for Richmond Park is the ring oozel. It's a bird, a thrush, it's my favorite bird. It's related or looks very similar to a blackbird. And I remember as a kid looking through my book, Birds of Britain, Europe, Middle East and North Africa, coming across a plate with the blackbird and ring oozel on it, thinking to myself as a kid, oh, that looks so beautiful and looks so familiar. And when I read about it, I realized that the familiarity was only in its look. I mean, if you compare blackbird with a ring oozel, they're two different beasts altogether. I mean, the ring oozel's wild, you know, it's unapproachable normally. It's got a crap song. It's a summer visitor. It lives in the wilder areas of Britain in the west and the east and sorry, the north shot, should I say, and it actually migrates to uh, southern Europe, northern Africa every year. And it's only roughly 7,000, maybe 6,000 pairs and decreasing in this country compared to eight to nine million blackbirds. So I thought to myself, I'll never see a ring of who's going to take me to the countryside because as a kid, I was told that only Wild, wildlife is only to be seen in the countryside. So I was thinking, who's going to take me to Snowdonia? Who's going to take me to the Cairngorms to see this bird? But to cut a very long story short, even though I did see a couple, like I twitched a couple on the CLRs, for example, it was one day in April, uh, 15 years ago. Like, in fact, let me go back. It was a night in April, 15 years ago, when I was asleep and I dreamt that I saw one on my patch. The following day, I went to my patch disbelieving of my dream and I walked around and saw you know a lot of the usual migrants coming through like white throats and black caps and stuff like that and going back to the car and it was a great day I remember that so vividly I went back to the car and then for some reason looked over my shoulder back at the scrubs and as I did a dark bird flew across my head landed about 100 meters away got my bins out and there filling the whole vision the whole vision was a male, an adult male ring oozel. My favorite bird had come to see me and I was beside myself. And basically every year since they've turned up. I mean, I could talk for ages about that story and how ring oozels have in, has influenced my life, but um, I will uh, maybe leave that for another time. Another bird that um, we're celebrating at the moment coming through at the scrubs um, and every spring is the, uh, the wheat ear, the northern wheat ear a bird that for me is the harbinger of spring and I'm sure you have them coming through in numbers at uh, in Richmond Park as well so we can uh, maybe discuss that later but uh, the news from the scrubs is that the northern edge of the scrubs um, very briefly has been sort of mowed down and they are building they're in the kind of uh, throes of building um, uh, the HS2 station which is that blue area here the rest of this area by the way is the development of uh, the lands further north but this area here is going to be twice the size of uh, waterloo station and they've already kind of impeded on the northern part of the scrubs in fact some of the best areas of the scrubs are now completely obliterated um, we had good numbers of nesting linnet and song thrush but unfortunately they're no longer to be uh, to be found there um, the key bird, apart from all the ones I've just discussed, is the uh, the ring neck parakeet, which you obviously are very familiar with. Not one of my favourites, but one of the reasons why I've included it on this particular talk is the fact that 
They gather in groups, they roost at the scrubs, and they attract people who have no interest in nature or had no interest in nature. And they have, some of them have developed an interest in nature because of this gateway bird. So thank you very much to Parakeet. Even though I'm not a great fan of yours, I do appreciate what you've done in terms of turning some people's heads. Okay, the next place I want to quickly take it to is Tower 42, also used to be known as the NatWest Tower, but T Tower 42 near Liverpool Street Station, I'm sure you're familiar, 600 feet up in the sky. Um, I formed the Tower 42 Bird Study Group uh, many years ago. Uh, we turned up every spring and autumn for a few hours a week to see what flew over. My idea was actually not so much to do that, but more to uh, to to get people to get people's attention to think about looking up, and the media bought into it immediately. So it's a great way of trying to convey to people that there's life. You just need to look up and see it. So the the, the scenery from the top of that building is incredible. London looks like a village, especially on a sunny day. On one, well, basically every day you'd see peregrines for start. Um, we have the second highest density in London of in, uh, urban uh, peregrines anywhere in the world after New York. So you see peregrines every day. Kestrels, um, another bird of prey, were much rarer. I mean, I think in nine years, I think we've seen kestrels, saw kestrels three times. So it wasn't uh, a great story concerning that bird. But one fateful day, we had a honey buzzard fly up from, this is in the spring, so it flew up, it flew up from the uh, south heading north, and that was amazing. But then we had a second bird, which was spotted over, spotted over Peckham and was heading north, and this is the actual bird. But then it's, it veered around, um, and instead of heading north, veered around and dropped altitude, flew past and in front of the uh, face of Big Ben, which I, I couldn't get over, it was just amazing. But then apparently, whilst it's flying towards um, Battersea, a guy was standing in his office looking north, uh, you know, an, a, a normal sort of office worker, and he saw this bird heading towards him and it kept coming, it kept coming, it kept coming, and all of a sudden, bam, it just hit the window and it landed on the deck. And he, he had the presence of mind to take a picture of it and contact the Tower 42 bird study group. Fortunately, 10 minutes later, the bird shook itself off and it carried on in its journey. But it was just amazing to think that such a rare bird could be flying over central London. Because when you think that in Britain, there's no more than maybe between 10 to 40 pairs per se, complete nesting in the UK. This bird may have been actually on its way to Scandinavia, but a rarity like that flying over London just shows you that anything can turn up anywhere at any time. And that's the beauty for me of urban birding. When you think that in Britain today, there's been what, 620 odd different species of bird on the British list, which has been formed since the early 1900s. And of that, at least 95% have turned up in urban areas. It shows just how important urban areas are. So that is my very quick um, run through of urban birding. Um, Please, you know, later on, maybe if you've got some questions, I'll be more than willing to answer them. Thank you very much. Right, David, that was that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, uh, well, when Nigel joins us, he'll be able to ask answer you questions about the Ring Oozel and Richmond Park. Personally, I've not seen one there. I love the fact that um, it seems to me wherever you go, <laughs> you're a bit like Dr. Doolittle. You can't, maybe you can't talk to them, but birds seem to turn up. So we need you down at Richmond Park soon. <laughs> we want you to come down there. And I think if you do, you're gonna get lots of people following you. So a bit, a bit of Pied Piper as well with, uh, with people following you because um, just to see the birds that you see is quite extraordinary. And I think all your stories about, um, you know, Dartford warblers and so on really, um, touched a nerve with us. I think many of us in the park have had those wonderful experiences. Um, I think it's also tragic uh, what you were saying about the scrubs and, um, you know, okay, you've got the incursion of HS2. We're fighting on fronts with, uh, you know, Skylarks breeding areas at the moment and try not to be disturbed. Uh, the threat of Heathrow flight paths going over the park, which is a major one as well, and the disturbance that will cause. But 
um, we feel for you, I think is the expression, definitely. Okay, um, we'll come back to you, David, for some more later on. We'll look forward to that. Uh, before we get to the film, which we'll do in a moment, um, let's have our second uh, bird song te test, if the team are ready with the audio file. I think you know the format by now. We're gonna play you a audio file of uh, the birds. You have a listen, four choices, uh, which are gonna go up on the screen any moment and you have a guess as to what they are, or maybe you know. Boats are pouring in now. It's going pretty well, but I, so I think we'll uh, leave it there. So we have got six went for a carrion crow, 6% went for a carrion crow, 6% common buzzard, 19% the kestrel, but of course it was a Richmond Park favourite, the little owl. So I hope you enjoyed that. We will come back to more bird quizzes later. Lots to get through. So working with the Richmond Park bird group, we've made a new short film about some of the park's birds. And I say some of the park's birds, um, it's only really scratching the surface. Um, it doesn't really need any more introduction, except to say that we could sa sadly only featured this small sample. Um, you'll see some of the birds that David was talking about a moment ago and quite a few more, but um, hopefully our tech people are ready to play the film now. And if we could see our short film about Richmond Park's birds. Over 60 bird species regularly breed in Richmond Park, but that number is more than doubled by visiting migrants who either shelter here for the winter or come to breed, or there are also other uncommon sightings. And spring in the park sees marvellous migrating birds pouring in from Europe and Africa. Many of the earliest arrivals are warblers, such as the chiffchaff. Although some are now resident, most journey here from southern Europe and western Africa. From March and April, they sing out their own name, chiffchaff, chiffchaff, from the tops of trees and from bushes. Journeying from south of the Sahara Desert, common white-throat populations have recovered since devastating crashes in the late 1960s and mid-1980s. Their white throats and pretty song make the common white throat easily recognisable. Sadly, the virtuoso nightingale is no longer heard in the park, but the distinctive male black cap serenading females from treetops is known to many as the Nightingale of the North. Unlike the native kestrel, regularly spotted hovering for ground prey in Richmond Park, the hobby arrives from tropical Africa from April. Its favourite food is small birds and bats, or, in high summer, juicy dragonflies or beetles which it hunts and eats on the wing. Another beautiful African migrant, the wheat ear, is easy to distinguish by its trademark white rump, which gives a clue to the origins and meaning of its rather rude name, white arse. Wheat ears are usually seen in wild, rugged environments, but drop into the park en route to and from their breeding grounds. A rarer visitor in the park, the windchat, is another bird more usually seen in rocky hills and mountains. It is similar in appearance to the female of its chat cousin, the stone chat.
Some of our most loved migrants are the Hirondine family, swallows, house and sand martins, heralding summer's arrival. With their red throats and pale bodies, swallows have been pouring over our shores since early April, diving over grasslands and trees to feed on flying insects. And they're very adept in urban environments using handy perches. A close relative of swallows, smaller sand martins, need exposed sand or earth banks to create nest holes. We're particularly lucky in Richmond Park to have an artificial sand martin bank where they can nest safely. In May, our skies welcome dark brown screaming swifts their anchor-shaped wings scything through the air at speeds of up to 70 miles per hour. And they can stay in the air without ever touching the ground for 10 months. Their joyous screams truly are the sound of summer. A bird similar in its acrobatic skills to the high-flying hirondines is the common tern. In fact, it's sometimes nicknamed the swallow of the sea. So its presence in the park is very special. And this is encouraged by providing specially constructed nesting rounds. Our final marvelous passage migrant and rare park visitor is another water bird. The common sandpiper is widely seen in lakes and lochs in northern England and Scotland. Maybe it comes to Richmond Park for the sunshine. <laughs> Among the park's resident birds, perhaps the most frequently seen is the strutting, jaunty jackdaw some 12 centimetres smaller than its larger cousin, the carrion crow, also seen here. The glossy, silver-grey headed jackdaw often nests in tree holes in the park. The park's grasslands are home to small rodents and these small birds and insects are essential food for visiting and resident raptors. An inspiring, exciting sight in the park is a keen-eyed kestrel. This hovering hunter is said to be able to spot a beetle from 50 meters, but its preferred diet is voles. They also like to perch on trees and fences, seeking out their prey. The common buzzard is over 20 centimetres larger than the kestrel. Once confined to wilder or agricultural areas, but now the UK's most frequently seen bird of prey, it's thrilling to see small numbers gliding and soaring over Richmond Park, even dropping into or rising out of an enclosed plantation. Larger still is the magnificent red kite. On the verge of extinction in the UK, in 1989, the RSPB started a highly successful reintroduction campaign. And this distinctive raptor, with its reddish brown body, angled wings, deeply forked tail, and a wingspan of up to nearly two meters, can now be seen gliding gracefully over Richmond Park and even the surrounding suburbs. By contrast, the little owl suffered a recent 25% population decline nationally, but Richmond Park is a relative stronghold. Introduced to the UK in the mid-19th century, it is the country's smallest owl 
and unlike the larger tawny owl, is regularly seen in daytime, often at dusk or dawn. Besides providing nesting sites for larger birds, the park's trees are also home to many smaller birds. The tiny tree creeper is a true gymnast, exploring branches and bark from every angle, seeking out spiders and insects with its beautifully designed curved beak. Rounder, stockier and slightly larger, the nuthatch is also perfectly at home among Richmond Park's bigger and older trees, and its distinctive undulating whistling call can be heard among the trees throughout spring. Like the tree creeper, it usually can be seen exploring the higher canopy for insects, but from autumn it scouts the woodland carpet for acorns, beech mast and other nuts. Although dependent on tree holes for nesting, the UK's largest woodpecker, the green woodpecker, actually hunts for much of the time on the ground. Its favourite food is yellow meadow ants, which live in Richmond Park's distinctive but fragile ant hills. The wonderful green woodpecker, with its bold red head and laughing call, is regarded by many as the park's favourite bird. Its smaller black, white and red cousin, the greater spotted woodpecker, can also be heard drumming in the park. Small birds can often be seen in the park's bracken and thorn bushes. With its dark body, black head, white throat band and red breast, perhaps the most distinctive is the male stone chat. Its sharp call, like two stones lightly hit together, is often another clue to its name, chap chap, chap chap. Another Richmond Park favourite, found mostly around the pen ponds, is the reed bunting. Relying on damp habitats, it has suffered a recent population decline of over 30%. So it's a special treat to see this handsome bird with its black head and white throat band in the park. The pen ponds see numerous gulls, geese, ducks and other water birds. One of the most frequently seen is the tufted duck, which sees numbers increase in the park during winter, but many breed in the UK. With its ponytail style tuft and white sides, the males are highly distinctive, while females sport a brown side panel. Many clips used in this film were kindly supplied by the RSPB. The bird protection charity was founded by women back in the 1890s, campaigning against the persecution of hundreds of thousands of birds killed for their feathers used in hats. The beautiful great crested grebe was hunted almost to extinction, and but for the action of these early conservationists, we would be deprived of their graceful courtship ritual, beautifully captured here. A special thank you to the RSPB for their support of this film, and especially to the many marvellous bird species that enrich Richmond Park's wildlife. But all the bird's sensitive habitats need respect and careful protection. Please remember to give all wildlife space, keep dogs on leads, stick to main footpaths, and always tread lightly in Richmond Park. Good. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. I rather like that music, actually. It's quite moody. 
isn't it? Um, and uh, as I said, that uh, well, with that film, uh, it's great to have um, played it today. We will put it onto YouTube um, within the next few days. So if you want to share it with people and show it around, we'd obviously be delighted and very happy for you to do that. So look out for that and we'll put it in our members bulletins. Um, I'd also just like to give you a quick reminder. Do send us in your questions. It doesn't matter. I mean, I know I'm not a great birder. I love my birds and I, I go out with my bins regularly watching, but I'm fascinated by David's knowledge. And we've got another um, man with great knowledge joining us later. So please do send your questions in um, about anything at all to do with the birds, lice of, of Richmond Park or indeed anywhere in Britain. We'd love to hear from you. So we're going to get to another little um, bird quiz now, uh, a bird call quiz or a bird song quiz, the third of our uh, tests now. Oh, here it is. It's just jumped in. Look at that. So here we go. I'll give you a clue. We did see this chap in the last clip in the film. Oh, the firm favourite. Well, actually, no, no, there isn't. The others are catching up. This is a bit like the Grand National. It's very exciting watching the results pour in. There's been no fallers yet. I think that's enough. Uh, we've let's close the voting on that. Well, look at that, would you? So 12% opted for a tree creeper, 28% for a green woodpecker, 26% for the common white throat, but no, it was the nuthatch. You can usually hear the nuthatch up in um, tree can canopies above you. So it's, um, it's a difficult bird to see, but a, a, it's a lovely, fun little song it has, it's beautiful. So now um, I'm gonna hand back to David if he's ready for his second presentation, which we're all looking forward to. So David, you're, you're gonna be focusing, I believe, on um, some special migrants that we see over here. Yeah, it will be. It's interesting watching that film, actually, because it's it, it's fascinating seeing, you know, what birds have increased over the, the years and, you know, what birds are not mentioned at all now. Yeah. Um, and had that film been made 20 years ago, it would have been a different film. So it's quite interesting, you know, red kite, for example, being such a prominent bird now, whereas in the past, you know, when I was watching birds in London, it was a rarity. But then when you think that back in the Middle Ages, it was the birds scavenging the streets of London, uh, picking up refuge. Um, and it was actually honoured at that time until gamekeeping was invented in very commas and people thought they were vermin and basically exterminated them to the point where, um, you know, they were, had to be reintroduced. So yeah. it's fascinating. Well, yeah, I, I, I was amazed when you, when you showed us the map of the scrubs and that, you know, that little isolated green area that you've got there, you know, surrounded, you know, urban surround all around, you know, hard pavements, street lights, everything else. And yet you have such a rich bird life there. It's incredible. Well, we've recorded um, 150 different species. Right. There's not a lick of water anywhere yet. We're, our wader list is phenomenal. You know, we've had all sorts ranging from the common sandpiper through to curlew, oyster catcher, you know, amazing birds, snipe, you know, woodcock that turn up on a regular basis, yeah. wing, you know, so it's incredible. That's brilliant. It's incredible. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I've, I've heard a lot more, um, you know, I said earlier um, in the introduction that I think we've become more tuned in this year uh, for some reason um, to birdsong. And I've noticed around, uh, I live in uh, St. Margaret's, which is just outside Richmond, just south of Richmond, and the west of Richmond rather. And we're hearing black caps around here in the streets, which is extraordinary. Um, you know, think of them as a woodland bird, but it's lovely hearing. Absolutely, but it goes back to what I said earlier, which is the fact that um, birds see our urban habitats as fragmented versions of what they should be in anyway. So yeah. your garden is a bit of open woodland, you know, the, the, the park itself is a, is a woodland, is, you know, grassland. Is, for them, it's the same as being out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So that's how we need to look at birds in order to really kind of understand how they work. Great. All right, David, well, over to you now for your second piece. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, let's see if I can share my screen now. In this instance, I have to uh, do this. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just quickly run through a couple of the birds that 
have already actually been spoken about in many ways, but just to talk about them a bit more, um, migrants that come through. This is the time, spring, I love spring, but actually I love autumn perhaps a, a bit more. But spring is great because, you know, the dark days of winter and then one by one birds start coming through. This is a black cap, the bird that we talked about earlier in the film. This is a female black cap and she's got this lovely brownish cap. Member of the Warbler family, um, and as correctly stated, um, has a beautiful song. For me, this is a male. For me, it's perhaps one, of, it's up there as one of the best songs to be heard in Britain. I mean, Nightingale's got to be number one. For me, second is Black Bird, and then third is the Black Cap. It's a beautiful warble, and it's a bird that uh, is predominantly a summer visitor to the UK. But over the last 40 years, there's been increasing numbers wintering in the UK, particularly in England and particularly in urban gardens. Uh, they normally uh, migrate to sub-Saharan Africa, the whole European population. But over the last 40 years, there's been a slight change in their movements in that the majority still heads south. Um, some of them actually winter in Spain and uh, Northern Africa as well. But there's a population from the east in Germany and Eastern Europe that instead of heading south, are kind of heading west and they kind of head towards us. And my colleagues at the British Trust for Ornithology tell me that over the last 40 years, these birds have been kind of evolving slightly. They have slightly thicker bills to deal with the bird table food and the bird feeders, which is amazing when you think that evolution is happening so quickly. It's incredible. So yeah, this is a beautiful bird. They're quite easy to see normally. Um, I mean, you have to wait around for them, but you'll see them in the canopies of the trees and listen out for their beautiful warbles, a song that you should be hearing a lot of now. They turn up, it's now what, May. They turn up certainly sort of early April, even late, um, January, February, March, late March. Um, so it's worth looking out for them now. They even can be in your gardens as well. Um, there's a couple of confusion species I want to, well, one confusion species I want to talk to, species I want to talk to you about, because there's, there's two of them that are quite similar. This is a chiff chaff, and again, it was in the film, um, named after its call. In Germany, it's called Zilp Zap, because it does actually sound like, sound like that, and plus it, even though it's called a chiff chaff, it actually does say chiff chaff chaff chiff chiff chaff. It kind of mixes it all up a bit. It's quite a dowdy looking bird when you see it in reality. It's browny yellow, but not very bright colored. Um, one of the distinctive marks for this bird is the fact that it's got dark legs. Um, and it's also that browny greenish look. And when you become more experienced and you see them flying around, they seem, for me, when I see them fly, they seem to be more tit-like in their shape, more dumpy than the willow warbler, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And the other distinctive thing about the chiff chaff is that when you see them furtively hopping around the trees looking for food, they always kind of bounce their tail quite a lot. They're always pumping their tail, whereas the willow warbler does it far less, less frequently. So that's another um, sort of diagnostic sort of mark to look for when you're trying to work out whether it's a chiff chaff or a willow wobbler. The other thing is that chiff chaffs, as the film suggested, are to be found in the UK in the winter as well. There's a growing population that winter in the UK. And again, that could be down to climate change. They predominantly um, winter in Southern Europe. So I'm in Spain right now and during the winter, they're one of the most common birds to be seen. They're like flies, they're everywhere. Um, and then they suddenly disappear in February obviously heading north and eventually to Britain. So that's the chiff chaff. Now the willow warbler um, is a different bird for me, but it is very similar to those who may not sort of know them that well to the chiff chaff. Um, it's more elongated. Its body is more kind of slenderer than a chiff chaff. Uh, when you get to know it a bit more, you realize that chiff, uh, willow warblers has slightly longer wings as well, but that's a technical point that you may not have to worry about at this point, but certainly there's more slender. They've got a stronger yellow uh, eye stripe or supercilium as we call it in the trade. 
So it's got a longer eye stripe. It um, tends to be sort of yellowish and whiter underneath and more greeny on the back. This one, um, I was, this picture was actually taken in, in Scotland and this bird is actually perhaps a little bit browner than it should be, but it still has the greener, more greener look than the chiff chaff. Um, but one diagnostic thing is its legs, it's got pale legs. Willow wobblers always have pale legs. Chiff chaffs, predominantly black legs, but occasionally their legs can be slightly paler, which obviously could be a problem in terms of identification. But in the main, they've got pale legs, flesh covered legs. The song is very different. It's a wistful warble that descends. I mean, I've seen it written and described as a waterfall. And I'm very terrible at actually interpreting um, or imitating bird call or bird songs, but it's a very different song to the willow wobbler, to the chip shaft, should I say. And willow wobblers are strictly summer visitors um, wintering in sub-Saharan Africa. There's been one or two records of birds in the winter, but mostly the uh, chip shafts, not willow wobblers. So that's in a, in a nutshell, the differences between the two. Willow wobblers um, tend to nest further north. Um, chip shafts are more southern in the UK. Willow wobblers tend to pass through London uh, in the spring and autumn. And in the autumn, uh, the young birds are very yellow compared to chiff chaffs. Um, not too many breed in London these days. And I'd be keen to know if there's many records of breeding in, Worm, in um, Richmond Park. So I know there's been a couple of Wormer scrubs, but certainly it'd be interesting to find out because there's plenty of tree cover in Richmond. Um, we talked about terns in the film earlier. This is a common tern, a beautiful bird, um, a bird that's increased a hell of a lot over the last few decades, particularly uh, in urban areas, they are nesting more frequently in reservoirs and in places where rafts are provided, as in Richmond Park. Um, beautiful, distinctive bird, um, smaller than a, a gull, slenderer, long reddish bill with a dark tip, the black cap um, and the orange legs. The most similar species to them is the Arctic tern, um, which is a bird that turns up on migration in London, um, but not a breeder. They breed on the coasts and normally further north. The Arctic Tern has shorter legs. Sometimes it looks almost legless. So this bird is really long legged compared to an Arctic Tern. And the Arctic Tern has a stronger reddish bill, red bill with no black tip. And also the common tern has dark primaries, darkish on its wings. So when you see them fly, you can always see a dark area on the wingtip, whereas Arctic Turns wings are translucent white, so you can sort of see the difference there. I mean, there's other differences as well, but common tern is a fairly distinctive bird, certainly in the London area. Um, in the film, also were hirundines, uh, swallow being one of them, but also there's house martin and sand martin. There's three species uh, of hirundine swallows that occur in the UK. The swallow is one that actually. Um, in the UK, it's more of a rural bird than it is urban. I mean, I've been to cities elsewhere in the world, um, such as Taipei and Taiwan, where they are nesting in amongst people right in the heart of cities. Whereas in Britain, they are more sort of, you know, as I say, more rustic. But obviously, there's, there's, there's birds breeding in Richmond Park. And in the past, I know there were birds breeding even closer to central London, but those birds are not so common breeding now in those areas and more of them of a passage migrant. You're more likely to see, well, hopefully house martin, even though that's unfortunately declined by a hell of a lot over the last few decades. Um, I think the final bird I got on my little list is the swift, um, which again was mentioned in the film. And there's one, by the way, on my shoulder here. This one on my shoulder is a slightly different species. This is an alpine swift which is Europe's biggest swift. So imagine a normal swift, but maybe a third bigger and maybe a third faster. I mean, these birds are like bullets. But anyway, enough about the uh, alpine swift and onto the common swift. The common swift is a, an amazing bird. It's one of my favorites. They show up um, now, basically, and they're around until August and then they're gone. And they spend an inordinate amount of time in the air. It's incredible. I mean, if they didn't have to breed, they'd probably spend the rest of their lives in the air. Um, quite different to swallows and house martins. The one thing to look for is when you see them flying in the sky, they look like bits of burnt paper that's drifting around. 
you know, uh, on stiff wings. So that's a great way of telling them because Swallows and Martins bend their wings and flap more, whereas these guys glide and fly but with stiff wings. And during the uh, early breeding season, they chase themselves around the houses screaming, uh, hence their old English name, Devil Bird, because they used to make unearthly screams as they flew along at breakneck speed. Um, they are declining, unfortunately. We need to have more holes in our buildings. Please, developers, any developers out there, please build buildings with swift bricks. And if you have a house that you can try and amend in terms of putting in nest boxes or swift bricks, please do, because these, these birds definitely need them. Without the holes, they can't breed. And I think that's oh, actually one more bird. That's the hobby. The hobby, again, in that film that you saw, a very graceful falcon, summer visiting, um, very uh, different to a kestrel in many respects, in that its wings are almost swift-like, very scythe-like, um, unlike the uh, kestrel, and this falcon does not hover. So if you see a, 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 a falcon flying around chasing after insects or birds um, during the summer, and it has the reddish marks on its uh, the reddish um, trousers, we call them, the, the, on its legs, the red marks on its uh, on its thighs and the stripy chest, then you're looking probably at, at a hobby. The only other bird that you could possibly comp um, confuse it with is the peregrine, which is a very muscular bird. It does have a similar shape, it has to be said, but it's much more muscular um, and bigger as well. So yeah, there are some of the uh, migrants that you might be seeing if you go outside now to look at the birds in Richmond Park. So that's the end of my talk. And please, again, if you've got any questions, then don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, yeah no, thanks, David. That was great. I found that really useful because um, in Richmond Park, I've always had struggled with uh, differentiation between hobbies and uh, kestrels. The, the hovering thing is really important, as you say. But yeah. uh, I've never actually seen one catch a dragonfly midair. I'd love to see oh. it. That's amazing. One more thing to say, I noticed in the queries that people were asking about some of the, two of the birds that I spoke about previously in my yep. first part, the, the, um, the black and white thrush, that's a ring oozel, ring oozel, and the bird of prey at the end is called a honey buzzard. And in fact, even though it's called a honey buzzard, it's not actually related to buzzards, it's actually more related to kites. Oh, right, I didn't know that. It's interesting. Mm. Okay, well, we've got, we've got some more questions pouring in. We'll come to those in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, though, we'll just do uh, one more little bird song quiz. Um, so our, first, our fourth one. So I think you all know the format now. So let's play the... Uh, what is this little beauty? Right, here we go. Those are your options. Firm favourite here, rolling up, a uh, few others coming in, right, another couple of seconds, right, we have, I think that's, I think this one is, is come up with the most overwhelming firm favourite, so there was just, just, I think just uh, a very small number said blackbird, Quite a, few, a number said the carrion crow, I could get that. Uh, quite a few said the parakeet, but overwhelmingly they opted for the jaunty, cheeky chappy himself, the jackdaw. Uh, fantastic, I love, I love that sound. It's a real Richmond Park sound, and I, I hope the jackdaws can speak up a little bit louder and drown out the parakeets, personally. Uh, that's a personal point of view. Um, so uh, next, I'd like to welcome uh, Nigel Jackman to, to join us. Um, so we've got a lot of questions coming and Nigel, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, chair of the Richmond Park Bird Group and working with other birders in the park, he, they record um, birds that have visited the park. And um, so Nigel, uh, hopefully you can hear me and we can hear you. Just quickly, um, anything of particular note that um, you've seen this uh, recently, I should say, in the park? Um, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Richard and David. Um, this is, it's that time of the year, isn't it? Spring. So there's, there's so much coming through by way of migrants. 
um, the black caps that were mentioned earlier. Uh, lots of black black cap, very vocal. Um, there's a thing about birds, they either um, sit out in the open or they skulk out of sight. And the ones that skulk out of sight are so frustrating. The birds like the black cap, um, pretty visible, pretty obliging, always hear them. And the other bird that's been coming through in very good numbers this year has been the wheat ear. I haven't seen so many for years and they're a very obliging bird. For anybody who wants to get out and see them, um, they've been migrating through for about three weeks or so. But I think, you know, for another couple of weeks, you can still expect to see them on some of the open grassy areas um, around the um, grassy grassland where the um, mole hills are in particular, sorry, the ant hills are in particular. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just, just I'm, I'm going through some questions here, Nigel, for people that have been rolling in here. Um, firstly, I did, before we get to real questions, Belinda P says uh, to David, he, she once did a walk with you on Merman Scrubs, David, and um, you, uh, you took uh, Linda around the area and they, she saw so many different birds with you. So hopefully it was a memorable time for all of you. Um, just moving on to some quick questions. There's, let's, let's handle the most difficult, controversial question to begin with, shall we? Our dear friend, green friend, the parakeet. Now, um, I've seen that there's, there's a lot of fact, I mean, you mo mentioned a moment ago, David, how they've actually sort of highlighted various issues in that a lot of people, because they love them, um, have got, got into birding that way. But I think, because this is a question for both, uh, for both Nigel and David here, I asked David first, I mean, you, you talked a little bit about parakeets earlier. What's, um, what is your real sort of issue with uh, parakeets, David? I think my main gripe is the fact that my dawn chorus is drawn is uh, drowned out. Yeah, that's my main. They're very noisy, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, that's my main gripe. Right. So when you were in that Ishii rugby ground a few years back, did you have to grit your teeth? You know what? <laughs> that was interesting because that was the first time I ever did anything on TV in oh, terms really? of that was my first day. So I, you could have time to talk about anything, and I've been very excited. Um, no, I mean, it, it was, uh, I think, you know, you have to appreciate what they do in terms of how they can be a gateway for people to become interested in nature. So that I respect, but I have a problem with birds that, or other animals per se, that are not native to a region mm -hmm. and then suddenly are introduced. But then that said, I have to question myself. I know I'm sort of contradicting myself now, but I've got to question myself saying, well, I've accepted little owl, pheasant, mute swan, and a few other birds like that. Yeah. So why can't I accept a uh, parakeet? And I think part of it is because I feel that, you know, they should be somewhere else, but then, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, they're individually beautiful, but collectively very noisy, aren't they? That's the issue. Uh, they are, they are. But I mean, you know, as I say, they draw people in, which is the, the main thing. And I think, you know, it's important that more people get connected to nature and if they, if that connection is through a parakeet, then so be it. Okay. I have a question here for, for Nigel from a Sarah Baranowski, who's saying, are parakeets considered to be a problem in the park, in Richmond Park? Yes, they are. And I think the problem lies more with the, um, the arboriculturists in the park, the tree, the tree people, because the parakeets definitely um, pick up bugs and, um, and the like and can damage um, trees and stunt their growth. In, in, in a sense, I get them in my garden and they're pulling bits and pieces off my conifers. They do do damage and out in the countryside, they can also damage crops. Um, as far as um, nesting um, complex is concerned, I think the, the jury seems to be out. There's a general um, conception that parakeets compete with other whole nesting birds and deprive them of their opportunities. But studies have found that that hasn't particularly been the case. Richmond Park is blessed with so many trees, so many cavities, that, that it's just like the jackdaws um, of whole nesters, that um, there seems to be a, a, a manageable balance there. But, um, yes, I agree exactly with David, we, we, on balance, we'd rather they weren't there than they are. Yeah. I've, I've seen them, um, I've seen uh, parakeets facing off with jackdaws, fight, battling over a hole, or should it be beaking off? where they're um, actually challenging each other for holes. And I'm afraid the, um, the parakeets won in that particular instance. But the current, um, 
The crows in the park do have a say in it as well. They do. Oh, yeah, the crows. crows I do remember a crow beheading a parakeet on one occasion. Oh, dear. Hang on, this is PG certificate today. So just be careful. Well, what I'm happy about is the fact that peregrines have developed a taste for them. Oh, oh yeah. A yes, bit yes. of exotica. Yeah. That's yeah, good. Well, I found, you know, Mrs. Beaton's old uh, recipe book. There was a recipe for cook. This is amazing. This was published, I think, in the 1850s originally. There's a recipe for parakeets. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so maybe I'll circulate that. Again, it's PG, so we've got to be a bit careful here. Well, um, what's, it, what's interesting about that? Sorry to, to jump in there, guys. You know, um, people think that parakeets are a recent addition to our avifauna. But apparently the first ever breeding record in Britain was in 1853 in Great Yarmouth. And in the late 1800s, there was a thriving colony in North Fleet, so in Kent. So I can imagine that recipe is actually quite uh, current, yes. you know, contemporary. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'll try it uh, anyway. Um, question for you, David, specifically about uh, these sorts of things, bird books, uh, bird guides. Do you have any specific recommendations apart from your own? Which I'll give it another bit of advertising, which is brilliant. That's, that's kind. Um, um, but any, birds, any books you recommend in particular? Okay, well, there's a couple. I mean, one thing to remember about bird guides is the fact that they are just that, they're guides. So you, you'll see a picture in the book. I mean, I was a kid looking at this book, um, and this is actually the book I got from the library as a kid. I did try to return it, but the library's closed down. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I looked at this and I saw the illustrations and I imagined I'd be seeing the bird exactly looking like that. And in reality, it's very different because birds do vary in their look in terms of the time of year and, you know, what race they are, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The birds, the books that I use, I use the Collins Field Guide, which is the, the Bible for birders. But this book, to be honest, is quite complex, especially for beginners. It covers right. birds that you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see in the UK or rarities. But it's a good book, you know, for the sort of experience onwards. Mm. Um, I think this one's a good one. There's a pocket version of this book uh, of Britain's birds. Who's um, that published by? That one? Who's that published by? It's published by Princeton and Wild Guides. Okay, Princeton and Wild Guides. It's a photographic book, so there's and lots right. of photos. Yeah. Um, but what's good about it is that it covers as many of the plumage variations as possible. And it's about Britain's birds. So you're not going to be confused by reading about crimson winged finches thinking, what's that? When you have to go to Sinai to see it. These are all British birds. So this is a good one. But the RSPB has put out some good books. I'm sure Nigel has some recommendations too. But, you know, there's plenty of good books to actually get started with. But remember, they are guides. And that's what they are, guides. Nigel, anything to add? I would um, also recommend this little book. It's pocket size, which is the advantage Just of it. Just move it over, move it over a little bit, Nigel. That's it. So, can you that's see that now? That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And good. it's a pocket guide, and it's um, new bird watchers pocket guide to birds of Britain and Europe, and that, this is octopus books. But right. That slips in any coat pocket. Really handy. Yeah. The other thing I would recommend to people: the guide to Richmond Park. Very nice chapter in there on the birds of Richmond Park. Move it over yeah. a bit, Nigel. That's it, lovely. I, I think actually just the, from the visitor centre. Yeah, if you can still get it, it's a rare item now. I think okay. we, may have, we may have sold out, but um, maybe and maybe for children. Plenty yeah. of other little books. Os Osborne Spotted's Guide. Um, really nice little starter book. Lovely. That's Osborne's. Osborne Spotted's Guide. Okay, let's move on with some of these questions. Um, we've got quite a few about skylarks. Uh, how many breeding pairs of skylarks are there? I'll, I'll give you, what, what, when's the best time to see and hear skylarks? And then how many breeding pairs of skylarks are there in the park? So uh, let's go to David first and say, when's the best time to see skylarks, do you reckon, David, and to identify them? Well, there are two separate times for me. Um, obviously, in the spring when they start singing is probably probably the best time to to, uh, to recognise and see them when they're up in the sky, really high up, singing continuously. Um, and what's interesting is they they sing for minutes on end. You kind of think, how can they? How can a small bird like that hold its breath for so long and just pour out this book, this song? Yeah. And in reality, uh, they use one lung at a time. Did you know that? 
they use one lung at a time that can inflate and deflate the lungs individually and keep singing which i learned about years ago but it was like an amazing fact when i first found out so springtime is obviously a great time to see them but for me also during the autumn or winter when you get roving flocks moving around as well um, maybe so much not so much in central or in london so much but certainly when i was on you know going to the scrubs on hard winter days i remember one winter there was lots of snow and i had a flock of 50 uh, skylarks all in snow sort of moving around together so for me there's two separate set times to see them but most people will see them in the spring and i'm sure nigel could be much much more pinpointed in terms of the exact times nigel over to you for uh, richmond park then specifically uh Okay, not so good on exact time. They, they, they seem to frequent the other side of the park to, to where I come in from. But the um, numbers of skylarks is variable from year to year in the Richmond Park. We know what a threat they're under and why we take um, special conservation measures at this time of the year. Um, they're found mainly on Crown Field, uh, which was the Roehampton Gate side of the park. We also may get the odd um, um, uh, site, breeding site at Lawn Field, Bog, if people are familiar with these 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 names that we're using and on the slade and um last year we had 18 uh, breeding territories in the park which is about at the top end of what we can expect mm. it does vary from year to year but it is holding up what we don't know so well is um, what the extent of breeding success is mm. and think fingers crossed um this has been a, a, a difficult period with so many people coming into the park yeah. But we are hoping that numbers won't, won't drop this, this summer. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I know that uh, when we when we made the piece um, with Claire Balding, we were in the park, we were in, the, in one of their areas very, very early March, and they were already up and singing. That was, I think, March the 1st, actually, and they were already up and singing. It was incredible. In fact, we arrived there, I remember now, and one went up immediately and started singing as if to welcome us. It was fantastic. Um, Another question for you, Nigel, and I'll come to one to you, David, in a minute. Uh, are there willow warblers in the park, Nigel? Yes, there are willow warblers. Um, I think in the last 10 years, we've only had one breeding record. They do pass through, and um, <coughs> one being heard singing regularly in the driftway in Sidmouth Wood over the last week or two. But uh, if it's staying or where it's going, um, as Sir David said, they will, they will drift north on, on passage. Okay. And of course, the more the more the trees leaf up, the more difficult they are to see, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. So if you it, it, you know, the trees are really getting a mantle on them now. So if you want to try to get to see them do it now, otherwise it becomes almost impossible. Um, so, D uh, David, a question for you. You, met, you mentioned that you're an extra Madura, I believe. So let's about somebody wants to know a bit about your bird watching or your birding in Spain. So where do you do it? What sort of things do you see? Okay, well, I'm in a region called Extremadura, which is the fifth largest region in Spain. It's in southwest Spain, um, between Madrid in the north and Seville in the south, and it borders Portugal to the west, so it's totally inland. The next region below is Andalusia, where the Costa del Sol is, and Malaga. Um, it's uh, the size of, twice the size of Wales, so it's a massive area. But only one million, or well, actually nine hundred and fifty thousand people, so it's sparsely populated. One of the most sparsely populated areas of Spain. Uh, it's fairly rural. Um, I am in the provincial capital. It's called Merida. Uh, has a population of around about sixty thousand. So even though it's called a city, it's more like a huge village. Um, and I live um, in the city itself or in the town, but literally ten minutes from the door. I'm in the countryside. Um, my birding, I mean, Extra Majuda is probably one of the best places in Western Europe for birding. You wow. can see a phenomenal amount of species, some of them even from the house. I mean, when I was in lockdown last year, we had a very draconian lockdown, we weren't allowed out anywhere, um, apart from going to a shop now and again. So I spent a lot of the time sitting on the terrace I've got. And even though I was looking mostly at uh, rooftops, chimneys and satellite dishes, I still managed in three months to get about 50 different species, including daily black and griffin vultures, uh, booted eagle. I once had a golden oriole flying over the house. Um, the local birds included serin, which is a, a finch, the smallest finch in Europe. Think of a sparrow and it's about a third smaller. 
a house sparrow's spotless starling, which is the southern, I suppose the Spanish Italian version of the uh, uh, normal starling, slightly bigger than our starling. But just down the road, there's the um, the river Guadiana, which runs through the city. The city itself, by the way, has the most amount of Roman ruins in the whole of Spain uh, in terms of cities. It's, it used to be the Roman capital back in the day, so there's amphitheatres, it's got the the longest and oldest Roman bridge in existence in the world, over a kilometre long, which spans Guadiana. And standing on that, in half an hour, you can be seeing 40, even up to 50 different species, including things like Western Swamp Hen, which is a, a bird, which is actually best seen there in the whole region. Uh, glossy Ibis, lots of different egrets, cattle egrets, squaw heron, all that sort of stuff. Um, and the raptor situation is ridiculous. I think there's 23 different species of breeding raptor. Literally 20 minutes from my house, I could be watching golden eagle, griffin, well, I can see Gri um, griffin and black vultures anyway here, and booted eagles, goshawk, you know, Bonelli's eagle. It's incredible. And also the smaller birds like um, Fecla, Fecla's lark and crested larks and um, penduline tit. I mean, it's just, it's just a paradise. I mean, my local patch down the road, I've seen 115 different species in 15 or 20 visits across one year. And if you compare that to 150 species of worm and scrubs over 25 years, I think you can get the difference there. So it's well, an amazing place to be. You've, you've definitely sold it to us. And, I, and no doubt the food's really good as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I won't get up because... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, from, from, from exotic ibis to linnets, um, we have a question here from another question from Belinda here, who wants to know, uh, she's seen linnets in the past. Uh, David, oh, well, let's do Nigel first. Uh, do we see linnets in Richmond Park? If you're lucky, and I've never been lucky. You've never been no, lucky, okay. They tend to be flyovers. Um, they're not resident in the park. They don't rest for any time in the park. But right. A good experienced bird watcher, which I'm not, will, will hear or, or, set, or identify them flying over. And uh, David, um, what about you? Do, you? do you get them in Spain or? Yes, yeah, so they're very common here. Very um, common. Just going back to London, uh, we had one of the biggest com uh, colonies in London nesting at Worm and Scrubs along the embankment, the northern area, which has now been destroyed by HS2. But we had about up to 11 or 12 pairs nesting and they were very frequent during the autumn and winter as well. They have a similar sound to a greenfinch, they twitter, but when you see them flying over, they've got a slimmer shape. Um, and yeah, they're kind of local in London. They, some areas where they're, they're fairly reg regularly seen in other areas, like, as you say, Nigel in Richmond Park, maybe mm. not so much, but maybe it's because it's quite wooded and they like kind of rougher, more scrubby areas. Mm. But in Spain, yeah, I mean, I was watching some yesterday even, they're, they're, they're fairly common. Right. Um, completely different sort of bird here. Common egrets, or li less small egrets, I little egrets, I should say. Um, are, they, are they breeding in London? Um, well, but a question to both of you. Do you want that to come in on that, Nigel, first of all, little egrets? They are breeding in London. Um, they're not breeding in the park. It's one of our um, big hopes that in, in years to come that little egret will start to breed here. They come and go a bit. That you won't see a little egret in the park every day, but they are becoming increasingly common. <clears throat> and uh, I've seen eight, nine at one time at the Lower Penn Ponds, which is amazing. Uh, otherwise, they're found at the ponds or probably along uh, Beverly Brook. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the most uh, obvious place to find a little egret if you went out next week, I think. Okay. And, uh, and David, have you seen them in London? Or yes. Breeding in London, I should say. Yeah, they started breeding in London in the late 90s in Walthamstow, and they've since spread. And it's amazing to think that 40 years ago, they were a rare vagrant to the whole of the UK. They are, they are a classic um example of climate change and how yeah. birds have moved from the mediterranean area north i mean they're even in scotland now so it's incredible how their spread has been um yeah and i've even seen them flying over the scrubs um it, at first they were extreme rarity but now you see them with some regularity um it's quite incredible what we talked about earlier in terms of how species have changed their distribution and abundance or you know lack of abundance over the decades. I mean, think about, for example, the collared dove. I'm sure Nigel, the collared dove shows up at Richmond Park. 
yes, yes. Okay, to think that in 1953 and before then, they were unheard of in UK. The first birds actually, the first bird was twitched in 1952, um, and they spread from the east. And now they're something that we see all the time. So it's incredible how, you know, how things can change in such a relative short period of time. If somebody, in fact, if, if anybody wants to go and see little egrets now, a really good place to see them locally here is uh, on the Thames by Isleworth 8, which is, um, if you go to old Isleworth, there's a little island there, uh, and there's a river path, and there's this little boatyard with some, so it's an amazing area actually, and you regularly see uh, several little egrets uh, hunting there. There's a big heronry behind and little egrets in the water, so it's quite a spectacular little area. So to get yourself down there. Um, right, what else have we got? Oh, where is this, uh, one for you, Nigel, where is the Sound Martin wall in the park? Or is that a big secret? No, 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 not at all. Um, it was built in about, about eight or nine years ago. And there was a suggestion it was built in the wrong place, facing the wrong direction. And no Sound Martins came to it at all. And then uh, a few years later, I think, it was suggested again that it was an overflow from Barnes Wetland Centre. They had um, no, no vacancies signed up and the Sam Martin started coming into Richmond Park and using the, um, the bank quite extensively. And it's set right up at the back of Upper Penn Pond. So if you're standing at the causeway, for example, look right up past the island. On the right, you've got the reed beds and in the centre, you've got this um, uh, concrete looking uh, uh, construction uh, with about 40 holes poured into it, artificial um, nesting sites. And um, it's increasingly popular with the sand martins. If you go to the park now, you will see sand martins um, swooping all over the, over the water um, for, for insects and, uh, and, and around the banks picking up nesting material. Okay, we're getting to, thank you, Nigel. We're getting towards the end of the uh, Q and A session now, and the end indeed of the of the uh, webinar. Um, quick question for you, though, David. I just wanted to know you, you talked a bit about uh, climate change and the, on the migratory migration talk as well. What other and we've talked about how these birds come these amazing distances of four or five thousand miles to come over here for some reason. Um, why? Uh, how? What? What are the threats on the way? I mean, obviously, what about their local habitats and hunters? And you know, um, what? Are, what sort of? What's the journey like for them? Well, for some birds, it's harrowing, to be honest. Um, firstly, when it comes to habitat destruction, there's destruction not only in their wintering quarters, but also when they arrive here. I mean, a turtle dove's a classic example of coming back to sterile monoculture farmland and there's no, nowhere to feed on seeds or anything. So it's all breed because mm. uh, we're, we're, we're just hell bent on decimating our woodlands. Mm. So that's one thing, but the major thing on top of that is hunting. I mean, in the Mediterranean region, North Africa, as well as in the Mediterranean itself, including Spain, and, Spain. and other countries like Italy, especially and uh, Cyprus, they are hunted wholesale. I mean, I, I've heard that, is it the, Italian government have decided that they've allowed hunters to hunt some ridiculous numbers of millions of turtle dove this year. You know, a bird that's dis diminished, I think, since the early 80s by 90 odd percent. A bird that potentially could become extinct in the UK as a breeding bird within the next 20 years. A bird that most kids grow up not knowing what a turtle dove was other than hearing it in a mm. Christmas rhyme. Oh. You know, it's just heartbreaking. Um, these birds are now being caught wholesale. You know, the people are putting up mist nests, mist nets in, in Liberia, sorry, in Libya and places like that um, in North Africa and just catching everything and killing everything and using some of it. It's just, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's tragic, it's really tragic. Um, last, last question for Nigel here quickly, but well, two questions, one from Anne Fawcett, one from Sarah Travers. And Fawcett says, uh, are woodcocks in the park? Question mark. And the other one is, has anyone heard of cuckoo in the park this year? Nigel. Um, second question first. No, we haven't heard of cuckoo yet. And we're all um, waiting expectantly for our first call. So they, they are in the country now. And we're waiting desperately to hear, hear and see one of our own. Um, now, um, 
As far as Woodcock, Woodcock are concerned, Richmond Park is one of the best places close to London for Woodcock. But seeing Woodcock is another matter. They, um, they um, uh, go to roost during the day and come out at dusk to, to feed in, in open spaces. So unless you're lucky enough to flush one, um, and you'll, you'll know it if you find it, um, you have to come in um, a little while before dusk and stand outside one of the woods like Prince Charles Spinney, like Sidmouth Wood, and uh, hope that you're going to see these birds fly out low and fast overhead. And um, you don't get a real idea of you know, what they look like. It's an experience, and it's a marvellous experience. And yeah. uh, we have hunts, we call them, a couple of times every winter, just for that experience. OK, thank you, Nigel. Last question for David here, and that'll be the, the wrap up on that, which is, uh, David, do you know if there's a good online? This comes from P H E. Um, is there a good online resource for or app for identifying bird songs and sounds? Uh, there's a couple that um, are available. One's called Warbler, um, Warbler without the E, um, and it's a bit of a Shazam. You just hold it up and it theoretically tells you what's um, what's singing. But with all these kind of apps, they need more people to do it, to build up the, the memory so that they can actually identify things more clearly. So that's one app that I would suggest. Another one um, is produced by um, the Cornell Laboratory for Ornithology in America. Um, they're called, the, the app's called Merlin. And even though it's an American thing, it's actually worldwide. And again, they do also have sounds that or the ability for you to, to record a sound and it, it may be able to tell you what it is. Other than that, um, there is a Collins bird guide, which I mentioned earlier, but as an app form of that, um, that has the calls. So you can actually kind of listen to the call maybe and compare. Um, bird song and calls are a very difficult, difficult element of birding as far as I'm concerned. I'm, I, even though people think I'm good, I don't think I am that good at all. And it's one of those things that I think you need to learn organically and not prescriptively. You know, you can't just listen to it and think, well, I'll go out and listen to bird and recognize what it is because birds always sound different and often different to the recording you hear. So try and when you're listening to birds singing, try and find the singer or the bird, the bird making the calls and make that connection that way. Um, and try and think about it phonetically in your own mind as to how that sound or song sounds like. And then that's the best way of remembering what the birds are. Yeah, and as we've seen with the um, little bird song quizzes we've had, how ambiguous it is really. You know, it's you, hard. you hear it's hard. something, you know. It's hard to recognize, when you hear it on this yeah. format, or I remember once being on Radio 4 and suddenly you put under the spotlight, right, can you identify these calls, David? Yeah, and I'm yeah. thinking, ah, oh. and then they made the calls and it's, it's out of context, yes. you know, a kingfisher's call on Radio 4 oh, yeah. on your mobile, it's very difficult to identify. Yeah. If you're there, then by a river, then you can actually say, oh, that's a kingfisher. And yeah. I struggled because it's out of context. Yeah. So it is a very difficult thing. It's not easy just to pick up a, a call and say, yeah, that's that, whatever. Um, you have to be in context half the time. Yeah. There is a... Um... There's a resource called Zeno Canto, isn't there? X-E-N-O Canto, which is where of literally thousands of people upload bird songs to this database. And you can tap into those. But I mean, there's a lot of rubbish in there. There are some very good ones on there. And I think the RSPB uses that resource on their website as well for, um, for bird song. Okay, I think that's it, unless you've got anything to add, gentlemen. But thank you very much. And um, we're going to move on to the final bit. I'll come back and do my proper thank you in a moment. But um, I just do the final bird song. That was a good segue there, uh, which is, um, I, have we got one more actually? Oh, actually, I don't think we have. I'm sorry about that. Okay, well, let's say goodbye to everyone. I just want to say a big thank you to um, uh, Nigel and to uh, Xanthi Gialusi and Roger Hillier, who have been behind the scenes helping us so much, and particularly to um, David Lindo. And I think um, it's been fascinating to hear David's experience and for him to share his, all his knowledge with us has been really, really special. And I think as David says to us all, don't forget to look up. 
Um, so thank you for joining us. Spread the word about the Friends of Richmond Park. As a conservation charity for the park, we're always keen to have new members uh, at www.frp.org.uk. And don't forget to look up and tread lightly in Richmond Park and enjoy a wonderful wildlife summer. Goodbye. <laughs>